an adventure motorcycle, preferably lightweight. And somewhere to go. And some people to go with. And this is something that me and my friends have been doing for a few years now. We've been all over Europe, here in the UK, heading down to France and Belgium. And last year we were in Spain having an incredible lightweight trans euro trail adventure and the general vibe these days if you want to have a big adventure you've got to go far from home and look to distant lands to go and explore and experience different cultures environments and trails and landscapes that you just don't have at home so that is scotland and we are on our way north we're going to head up that road into scotland and over the next week we're going to see how far we get Maybe we get to a beach on an island somewhere in the Outer Hebrides. Maybe we encounter some midges. One thing we're unlikely to do is do a lot of trail riding because of the rules and laws uh, north of the border. So, so this is really a bit of an experiment to see if you can have an adventure on small lightweight trail bikes in a country that has outlawed trail riding. We'll see what happens. Okay, we have Noel on his XR650... 650, 650 something. Uh, we have Clive on his CRF300 Rally. We've got Will on his 690. We've got uh, uh, Rufa on his 701. And waiting for us up there is Davey on the Gas Gas ES700 with all the event spec kit on. The landscapes in Scotland are absolutely stunning and they would be an incredible place to go and trail ride. But even though England and Scotland are neighbours and are part of the United Kingdom, England and Scotland have got different rules when it comes to where you can take a vehicle and where you can't. In England, there's a dedicated network of trails that have got legal classifications, which are roads, but those don't exist in Scotland. It's actually very easy to access the countryside in Scotland by foot because you have right to roam and you can wild camp. But if you're in a vehicle, it's really, really hard to find legal trails. And so with that in mind, we crossed the border with the idea that officially you can't trail ride in Scotland. So does that mean trail bikes have no place in Scotland? And what would happen if we went to the farthest, most northern reaches of the northwest of Scotland, the islands right up to the top of the Outer Hebrides on our small little trail bikes. Could we find roads that you could class as trails or was it gonna be tarmac only? There's only really one way to find out. End of day one. Uh, we have actually, oh, my hair, I've got helmet hair, found a beautiful little spot next to the river. I say found, Noel had put in a bit of pre trip planning and put a few pins on Google Maps. We got here a little bit late and the, the good spot was taken, but if this is the, the runner up spot, man, oh, everyone's on tent. Tent action. I'm gonna get some photos. 
There's a wonderful irony that in England you can take your motorcycle on byways open to traffic and access beautiful countryside on legal trails, but you can't stop and put your tent up because legally you can't wild camp in England. In Scotland, it's the total flip. You can wild camp pretty much anywhere, but you have to get there on foot or off the side of a road. You can't access that beautiful wild camping spot on your trail bike. This one. Oh, you know. How deep is it off to that ledge? It's really deep here. Yeah. You've got to go up on the side. Oh. Go on then. All right. I just don't want to fall over. Wild swim ticked off on day one. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. It is cold actually, yeah. All right, ready? I'm not these guys. What a beautiful morning. Last night, six out of 10 in the tent. Uh, pretty comfortable. My feet were cold. I used my Max earplugs and my Tam Podcast neck thing to go, I basically created a blindfold sensory deprivation <laughs> tent so i had a blindfold on and my max earplugs in uh which basically just knocked me out and i only really woke up because my feet were cold so yeah it's pretty pretty decent night for uh for tent tent camping cheers aero press buddy <laughs> waste not what not mm. I've uh, just realised I brought all the for magic coffee. I've only got two filters. Oh, on your AeroPress? Yeah. Oh, schoolboy. I know. You know what you need, don't you? A fancy coffee shop nearby where I can buy more. <laughs> as wonderful as the roads were, and there's not many of them, they were pretty busy with tourists. Even though the landscape was incredibly dramatic, I was really starting to wonder that if we're going to be on the road for the whole trip, was my little lightweight KTM 450 EXE that was vibrating up my bum for the last few hundred miles really the right choice of bike. Okay, so we stopped at this really, really beautiful. We didn't actually realize it was here, but I think this is like, because there's so many of this stuff up here, but we're in approaching Glencoe and, um, or we're in Glencoe. And so we've got the guys behind me, Davy and Clive next to this next to this beautiful waterfall the drone's gone up so over here we've got Will what have you been shooting Will? what have you been getting? Like, every angle is amazing right? the couple over there were saying oh come over here there's a little waterfall we just walked 10 metres off the road and there's this this place is spectacular yeah. as we headed further north and got through busy Fort William that is the gateway to the highlands the road started opening out into much more dramatic landscapes. We were firmly in the footsteps of the popular North Coast 500 route as we made our way up towards the Apple Cross Peninsula. Clive, what's the, what's the name of this bacon mole? It's called Kevin. <laughs> it's the NC 500. And for those uh, for those people watching that don't know what the NC500 is, <laughs> I'm literally, it's it's so big I can't even see your face. So I'll stop that now. <laughs> it's the north North Coast 500. It's a 500 mile route that goes around the west, north, and the east of Scotland for 500 miles. Is that what you brought us on? Just just following the, the one road that goes around Scotland. We don't need to brand it, we don't need to market it, we don't need to sell it, we don't need to put it on a sticker. Okay. Um, that man. We're going to go up the Postman's Trail. The Bacon Sandwich Man has told us about a secret trail. Everything's secret, isn't it? That only he and us know about. But only he and everybody and else that rides motorbikes knows about. 
and we're going to take it. It's tricky in places. There's some jeopardy. Not everyone will make it. <coughs> Him. <laughs> it might be like one of those horror films, you know, where they, yeah, you want to take the road down it, and there's like, when you get there, there's just like loads of scrap bikes, and then there's a cabin with helmets, loads of helmets <laughs> hanging up on the veranda, and there's just like stirring pot of... I feel for the younger, prettier people. They're going to be the first to get it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it will. Definitely. Male model. <laughs> Young yes. and pretty. At breakfast, we'd been so excited about this tip, about this secret trail from a local, which kind of felt like permission to go and explore. And we all headed off. And it didn't take long to realise that what a local might be riding on his little Beta trials bike might not equate to a fully loaded adventure motorcycle. Even though it's a lightweight adventure motorcycle, it's still a bigger bike with luggage. And as we ventured up this valley, two things became apparent. We were probably on the wrong bikes with not enough skill for the terrain ahead of us. And also, it really started to feel uncomfortable. We were looking at the maps and all of a sudden we transitioned from what was clearly a trail for vehicles, wide and hard packed, into something that was probably not really too clear about whether or not we should have been there. And at that point, it was time to turn around and head back. Not just because it was too challenging, but also it started to feel like we shouldn't really be there. The trail up to that point had been amazing and it still felt good to get our first taste of Scotland dirt. However, little did we know how short-lived that excitement was gonna be. Noel had been riding his tried and trusted Honda XR650L, which is about 20 years old now, and was keen to try out the brand new Gas Gas ES700. And so he decided with Davey to swap bikes and get a taste of what modern power actually feels like. What had actually happened is Noel had broken his foot, his third and fourth metatarsal, but he wasn't to discover that until we'd actually got back from the trip. It was truly gut-wrenching to see your friend lying on the floor in obvious agony. And at this point, I was thinking, this might be the end of the trip. So the gas gas, turns out my review of it is it's very powerful. If you try and lift the front end, it comes up really easily. We'll say that about it. Mm. It's one of its plus points. Yeah, it just came up and just kept coming up and coming up. And I wasn't, even though I've watched the Chris Birch video very recently, I wasn't covering the back brake. Mm. And I felt I was nowhere near the back brake. <coughs> yeah. <clears throat> she needed help. Your left yeah, right. We don't think it's broken, but we're not going to take the boot off mm. until we absolutely have to because it might not get it back on. And uh, yeah, Noel thankfully is up, and we're going to jump on the bikes and slowly meet the other guys. They probably think we've been dicking around taking photos, which we have, <laughs> kind of. Noel's accident has come as a real shock. Getting hurt on your bike's always a possibility, but bar a few small tumbles, we'd never had anything this serious before, and especially not from Noel. He was in real pain, and while it was a relief that he got up and hobbled onto his bike, I couldn't help but think that he was keeping the true seriousness of the situation to himself. We decided to cut the day short and head to the next campsite very carefully, at a leisurely pace, and figure out what the next steps would be. So no, where where are we? On a nice little campsite outside Gaelic, 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 
edit that bit out, Gerlock in the dunes, camping uh, and swimming in the sea tonight, hopefully. Yeah, let's see, so where the sea is. So here's Noel, let's go have a little look. Swim time, yeah. And there's the guys. Ah, we've done some brilliant oh, spots. River crossing. Really, really brilliant camp spots. Literally yards from the beach. I guess the next, the only way you can beat this is to camp on the beach. Maybe we'll do that on the islands. I don't know. Okay, yeah. Cool. Get your head in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great end to the day. Glass of wine on the beach now. Worth every mile that we have ridden. Pretty special. Snoop Dogg's finest. So, no, like this bit's on camera. So, you've had a bit of recuperation. How do I feel? Uh, yeah, how do you feel? How do you feel about what happened? So we couldn't really get that on camera earlier. Um, I feel gutted about it. Really? But I'll get it. Uh, I, feel, um, I feel I've let everyone down. I don't want any plans to change. Just feel bad, feel silly. I'm trying it. I'm trying to impress you. Good. <laughs> You but, you, feel good. but you know like no one if you said tomorrow like i need to go home guys like no one would feel like that you'd spoil it was just you know what i mean like we're all in it like any that could happen to any one of us Couldn't i don't know be. i think it'd be brilliant if it went home <laughs> <laughs> So we're losing, we're losing Noel, who has been the wine carrier on his Magadans. But fortunately, Clive also has Magadans, so we're going to take this off and put it on Clive's, and then the essentials get to come with us. You are now the essential carrier of provisions. Essential sorted. Don't want to end up on a beach without a glass of wine to enjoy the evening. Where are they? Where are they? There they are. So I think six is going to become five, and Noel is going to make his way back south in his own time. It's just dust. It's just dust. Dust everywhere. <laughs> I think there was one in the uh, in the shop. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're gonna get some. Oh, right. It had been a difficult day and a difficult night. And it was incredibly sad to be saying goodbye to Noel on that morning as we left the campsite. No one wants to leave their friend behind when everyone's waited so long to be out on an adventure together. 
It was with real sadness that we said goodbye to Noel that morning. He'd been our Sherpa, we'd been riding in his tracks. Noel knew exactly where to go, he knew exactly where the wild camping spots were. He was the one that would encourage us all to pitch tent in places that we might feel uncomfortable doing because we didn't have permission, because we were so British and trained to be only camping in service campsites with showers and loos and all the rest of it. Noel was the wild heart of the group and with him gone, how was the dynamic going to change? Six became five. We took an afternoon ferry from Olapool on the mainland to Stornoway on the Isle of Harris and Lewis. This was the most northern part of the trip, the furthest north that many of us had ever been. The ferry arrived in the early evening and we rolled off in search of somewhere to sleep. Tired, stressed and late at night we couldn't find somewhere that everyone agreed with. What followed was an even more stressful ride across the island in search for a campsite that had availability. Finally finding one at close to midnight that grudgingly let us in. We were delirious, exhausted and it became apparent that the bad energy of Noel's accident had followed us across the water. The next morning, the fractures in the group began to widen even further. Basically, we've got the option. 23 quid. Take yeah, the yeah. money out of the equation, right? We yeah. need to sail today and to spend another two nights on Harris. And, well, on the island. I know there's, you've got then, one campsite that Noel's recommended, which is on the south of Harris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the recommended campsite on so the south. So we'll, we'll go and do all that, we'll do that today if you want to. And tomorrow, or this evening, we'll have a look at the ferry crossings from the south of Harris and then over. Well, to go down to do just for a day and then back. Okay, so to so U-West, you mean? To you west and then back to the same campsite. And then ferry over uh, Friday afternoon. Yeah, I mean, there are, yeah, that's they're just options, you know? That's two options, we'll go to the old Friday, that's two options. Struggle to think that the island's big enough for... Well, that's why I was saying tomorrow we can break it up and go a little bit. I'm, you know, I'm easy. Well, let's just let's just go get some food, ride, see how it is. If people are like, yeah, I've seen everything I want to see, we just get the ferry that's been booked. Okay, we've had a parting of the ways. Will, Rupert, and Clive are heading back, and me and Davy are going to stay and explore the islands more. And. Uh, have two days to get back so they're getting the ferry now and we are going to get the ferry uh, in a few days time this was a really difficult part of the trip it become clear that we all wanted different things clive will and rupert had decided they wanted to keep moving and so headed back to the mainland to rejoin noel myself and davy had decided we were going to stay on the islands to explore when we left a few days earlier, the idea of having no plan had sounded like total freedom. But now as the guys were heading on the ferry and the group was splitting again, I suddenly realised how bad that idea had actually been. It's a bit, I mean, I, the way I see it, like when Rupert wasn't comfortable going up the, the trail, it's like you can't force someone to do that if they're not comfortable doing it so we all turned around and clive didn't want a wild camp last night so he was the least comfortable in that situation so we cracked on to a campsite you could say you know maybe i was a bit of a dick by not going back with people today i don't know why? But, they, Why? I, but they, I mean, they weren't comfortable staying for whatever reason and they wanted to leave, but... Maybe it's the turning point of... I wouldn't say a mood, I would say... It's not difference of opinions. Energy? Energy, maybe, yeah. It could be that Wednesday would be the turning point and what day is it a day? Yeah. Wednesday. So I think, like, there's, like... But every trip has got that point where you've got the the peak of excitement and then the the lull of tiredness and not even homesickness but like oh this is you know it's time to go home or whatever yeah. and i think it's like knowing when to listen to that because sometimes it it's relevant and sometimes but i think it's also a pattern that every trip has and it's knowing like when to ignore it and go no actually 
this is where the good bit starts, you yeah. know, where it actually feels a bit adventurous. But roughly our holidays, our micro adventures tend to be over a seven to ten day period, I think. Yeah. And we'll yeah. always start off great intentions, but you always get that lull. But then people sort of, they get their home and beacon on and they just want to want to go and they've had enough and that's it. Tiredness kicks in, fatigue, all that sort of stuff. Wild camping, camping campsites, noise, it's not everyone's cup of tea. As a parent of like small children, it's like, like time away is so hard, it's so precious, to, yeah, and it, it's like, like, this is the most special, beautiful bit, and in some ways, I would have kind of come up here and what in on day one if I could have done, do you know what I mean? Like, and then spend as much time up here, because this is the bit that's like, this is special, you know? It become clear that we all wanted different things out of this trip. For me and Davey, getting to the Outer Hebrides was an opportunity to explore. The island is littered by tiny twisty roads and sparsely populated. It really felt like there was magic here to be discovered. We left our camp in Lewis and headed to the next island of North Uist to see what we could find. Would this be the land of the elusive Scottish trails we'd been hunting for? Davey and I began to use the OS map on our Garmin GPS to look for the smallest roads and tracks that we could find. When we got to them, we took a view that if there was a gate or a private or no entry sign or anything that looked obvious that we shouldn't be there and people didn't want us there, we would turn around. The progress was slow, but there was a huge sense of achievement in discovering what was at the end of these tiny little tracks for ourselves. Okay, so we're at the a little dead end trail, which is we think it's probably like the old road, um, and there's loads of these. There's no sign, no gate. It's just like an old gravel dirt road, so it runs alongside the good road. So, Davy, what do you think of these? These superb little runoffs. They're just spotting them. That's the problem. You just gotta have your eyes peeled, haven't you? And just to see them. And uh, as soon as you see one, just try and divert to it and away you go. I mean, they're not hard or challenging or technical or anything like that, really, but they are quite beautiful. And the scenery is beautiful. And, and you know, it slows progress somewhat, but if you're not in a rush, We're at the end of this um, kind of single track road and um, we've seen on the OS map there's a uh, what looks like a gravel track going through some forest kind of I don't know if you can see it's on there but it's over there and in the distance we can see a van coming this way kicking up dirt so Davey I think we head that way there's a gate and it's obvious that we it's like private and we shouldn't be there we won't go oh is that the gravel right there that's the gravel there that's the left turn there no gate there, nothing saying don't be there. It's marked as a track on the OS map. So we're gonna go and see what, what's down there.
look at this Stevie! <laughs> what a find this one is! Okay, so we've, on the map, on the OS map, there's, this is marked as a, a track going straight across. It's obviously a causeway, but we've got no local knowledge about, I mean, we could follow the route on the GPS, but we've got no local knowledge about the tides or how dangerous it is. It obviously, it goes over to some ruins. So Davey, there are tire tracks on there, but I'm not brave enough without local knowledge. How far are you going, Davey? You doing the whole thing? Oh, dude. Yeah, but like, we'll get stuck on the other side. Oh my god! Are you f***ing kidding? Jesus Christ, that is unreal. Look at that. That is... That's a bit special, that is. <laughs> and the thing is, Total could have camped here. Literally could have camped here. Should have bought the tents. But... Yeah, you can't believe that we're actually still in the British Isles. Look at this. This is this is worth every every mile, every sore bum mile on that little bike to get here. <laughs> it's, it's pretty... Dry. You know, everyone in the UK should come and experience what is on their doorstep.
describe the drone shot? As a non-experienced drone pilot, what I would do is I would glide down the water line, follow the curvature off the beach, get all the weight sand in, get the fuel islands in the back, come along, hand back to the motorbikes on top of the dunes and show a fantastic camera spot. It's really, really I kind of apologise for big, so, being so gushing because it's really hard to you can't you can't convey it like it's just impossible to believe that this is not the caribbean apart from the weather <laughs> but in terms of what i can see with my eyes i'm stuck naked going for a swim it's gonna be cold Oh, I don't know if I can get my head under. I feel like this is enough. I feel like this is enough. I don't need to get my head under. There are trails in Scotland. They're just not what we're used to here in England. Every single track that we found that we went down, we turned around and came back. They were all dead ends. We went with the mentality to respectfully explore and respect what the locals said. And where possible, we stopped and talked to the locals to gauge their attitudes towards us on our lightweight bikes being on their trails. If they said no, we wouldn't go down. Every single local we met greeted us with a smile. The simple act of riding down a road or a trail that you don't know where the end leads is such a rewarding experience. I've put so many miles on my trail bike following GPXs that people have shared with me or I've downloaded that have taken me to some incredible places, but I've always done it with the confidence that I'm following a route that's been prepared. On this trip exploring in the Hebrides, we had no route. We had our map and our wits and our charm and at times, going down these tracks and roads without knowing where they went felt more adventurous than following those GPX routes that I'd done for all those thousands of miles. All the trails we went down were dead ends. Having a lightweight adventure bike made it really easy to turn around and come back. You could do it on a big bike, you could do it on any bike, but for me, the lightweight bike was perfect. You don't need to do this in Scotland. You can probably have this adventure in your own backyard. I bet there's a ton of roads that you ride past on the way to your trails that you don't know what's at the end of. There may be no dirt at the end of them, they may be dead ends, but until you discover them, they are undiscovered. But what I will say, if you do make it to Scotland and you make it as far as the Outer Hebrides, the views are incredible.